Welcome everyone, this is Craig from the University of Applied Research and Development with our Emergency Response and Risk Management Podcast. It is our privilege to have with us Ian Holt, who's the Head of GIS for Bayonet, which is the Mapping and Survey Services in the UAE. He's also a member over the last 14 years with Map Action, which is a UK-based charity that supports humanitarian services when there is an emergency or a disaster. So I'm delighted to have you with us, Ian. Thank you, delighted to be here. How about you tell us about your current role and what you're doing now? Okay, so right now, I, as, as Craig mentioned, there's there sort of two hats I'm, I'm wearing, one of which is my, my day job, which is head of um, GIS. My job was to really uh, bring in a commercial flavor to what was a, a company that relied very much on um, topographic and uh, bathymetric surveying to, for, its, for its revenues. But now it saw that there was more value in that data than just providing it to one customer. And so how do, they, how do they provide that to a wider range of customers and different users? And particularly now with um, artificial intelligence, uh, meaning that more information could be extracted from that data, there's possibly opportunities for greater value to be, to be gained. So my, my job uh, has been to build up a team of people who specialize in those aspects and then work alongside the rest of the business to deliver um, uh, uh, projects and deliver uh, products to the market that will help them uh, commercialize that data. And then with my other hat, uh, you mentioned the map action side, that's the, the voluntary side with, uh, within the emergency management sphere, whereby I'm, I'm, uh, I respond when I can to um, humanitarian emergencies and, and relief activities. Well, sometimes that's in the field uh, deployments and sometimes that's a, a, a slower burn where it's for, for example with the uh, coronavirus we've been asked the organization I should say has been asked to work alongside uh, the UN to uh, with, with the data that they have coming in from many other sources so it's not always in the field in a tent creating maps. That sounds interesting to jump on to right now tell us about that the bringing in the data to help emergency or services with what's happening right now with corona. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I must admit I've, I've not um, spent too much on this because other members of the team have been going through that. But there's, what, what, from what I've been observing, um, again, it's not something that we would typically deploy to the field. So, it, for example, in a, in a, a hurricane or um, an earthquake or um, an, another activity whereby um, the, uh, humanita any humanitarian parties deploy to the field and are providing a number of services, we would probably be providing GIS and, and mapping services. But in this case, um, it's much more of a, um, a, a medical um, situation, which is very much more dispersed. So it's more about looking after systems that various organizations are using. So with our sort of technical skills in the spatial sphere, how can we input and make those systems more valuable by putting that geography element into them and, and improving on that front? So just before I started recording, you said something interesting. You said everything has a geography to it. <laughs> so in terms of emergency preparedness or response, tell us about how, how that is used, how that can be beneficial with what you do. Yeah, I think, if, I think a colleague of mine coined the term something about everything happens somewhere. So I think when um, it starts from the very beginning of an, of an emergency, um, in terms of the most important critical products that um, as, um, as, 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 as geospatial um, uh, mappers do is to provide an operational picture of, of what's going on, who's doing what and where they're doing it. So that who, what, where mapping is probably one of the first pieces of information that we try to produce in the field. And from the very first moment, like, so as we try to deploy within uh, the first 24 hours of an emergency, because a lot happens at that point. Um, of course, the need is great at that point as well, but it's in that sort of emergency response phase, and you have a lot of actors coming into the field, a lot of other um, humanitarian bodies coming in. So where, where they often don't know where they're, they're going to uh, precisely. They often don't know where everybody else is deploying to. They don't know probably where, for example, where the, where, the, where the epicenter of the earthquake is or where the affected areas were. So knowing, having that information is vital to how they can deploy supplies or deploy their own teams and, and the skills that they bring in. So it's, it's vital that the geography has to, has to play a part and knowing where, that's, where everything's occurring is, is all part of that. So is the information digital only or is it physical? How do, how do you present it? 
So that's a great, that's a really great question. So um, I think probably most people would today would say, well, everything, you'd expect everything to be digital. There'll people be wandering around with, with iPads and they would be, uh, you know, sort of, maybe they'll be swapping um, USB sticks or they'll probably be using some sort of um, a network connectivity to be able to transmit data. And to a certain extent, that's true. And that's improved a lot um, in the last few years. But even so, people still like to walk away with hard copies. So, for example, if we're providing if we're providing um, maps that um, uh, helicopter pilots want to augment the information that they've already got, as in where they have to land and uh, maybe the, the sort of mountain passes they can they can uh, climb to. This is, and that is a particular reference to Nepal, where the helicopters only have, have a certain ceiling which they can reach. So, quite often they'll have to follow valleys up to a certain height. They can, but in any case, people want to have a, a paper product. So, I think for the the um, I mean, this is quite some time ago now, but I think for the Haitian earthquake, that we produced something like, in the, in the first two weeks we were there, something like about 5,000 maps for people to, who just, they just wanted something to come in and they want to be able to annotate it manually. That is transitioning to a, a more, much more electronic form, but still, there's still a need for physical copies of, of maps. And we, we, our role there is to put as much information on there to make it readable and usable. And so we'll have a number of mapping products for different type of organizations, whether they're dealing with sanitation or whether they're dealing with food mm. supply or, and, uh, and a variety of different uh, methods, I suppose. So as a, as a previous geography teacher many years ago, <laughs> and looking at topographical maps, that's kind of my my advanced level of mapping and what a map might look like. So I, can, I would imagine things have changed in these types of data that's available now that those maps are just a pale ancestor to. So can you describe some of the unique individual features that, that might be there now? Um, so you'd probably, again, be surprised that probably, probably a great deal hasn't changed um, in terms of, in terms of the data is very similar. It's often how, how it's captured and, and brought to us. So that could be, you know, we, we've got new, you know, we've got drones capturing data. We've got sometimes mm -hmm. satellites can be requisitioned to be, uh, particularly big emergencies, can be requisitioned to be put over um, uh, certain areas, uh, not necessarily by us, but by by the organisations who, who are able to do that. And so there's a there's a lot more information that's coming in. So it's often about distilling that down, and that's what a map is. A map is quite often a distillation of vast quantities of information. And also, what happens. Um, Again, this is a number of years ago, um, with, uh, when social media started to become used. And I think um, there was a, in the Kenyan elections, there was a, um, a tool called Ushahedi. Ushahedi, I think it is called. Uh, you, you might have to correct me on that one. But again, people were reporting what was going on on the ground. Just regular people were using text at that point. But now that's also exploded into people being able to report on, on smartphones and give precise locations of what's going on. And all that information, some of it's, some of it's great, some of it's just noise. So how do you filter all of that down into a picture that you can give to somebody to decide what to do? So quite often what we are producing is products that people can take away, so maps or, or data that they can take away and work on themselves. But often we'll go to the, uh, the planning meetings in, in major emergencies every, that happen, occur every day or, or maybe a couple of times a day to sort of give that operational picture of what's going on where. So again, you said uh, so maybe some of the mapping, uh, the cartography side of things has changed. I, I don't think it necessarily has. I think it's, it's, you're still, uh, again, like I said, distilling feature, uh, information down into, you know, maybe you're, you're still using contours to maybe display terrain, but you're still using um, lines and polygons and points to represent information that's going to be placed on top of that. It's, it's the skill comes into and how you make that clear and how you make that relevant to the person who's going to, be using it, um, and of course, with with um, with the digital element to it, maybe you can you know you can have three uh, D um, views to things. But um, quite often, it's it's a it's a quite a, not a chaotic picture, but a, a one that's changing rapidly, and people are uh, you know rushing around. So the last thing they want is to be um, ooing and ahhing over a lot of tech technology you know then you, know, you could say well why don't we have like nice um, VR headsets well of course if they, if you could put it on your head it would be instantly usable but if it's not it's not probably adding much to the situation so quite often even the simplest um, view of the world is one that works the best that's great
That's, that's a quote to keep right there. So you said that um, maybe the representation on the map is, is as it was before, but the way that the information is received, drones, satellites, are there other ways that information is being collected um, now that wouldn't have been done in the past? So, so, so like I said, the social media side. So, so there'll be, ver there'll be ver various hashtags and channels that um, – a number of organizations will, will listen to, not, not just us, other people will be doing their own filtering of that. But again, it can be, it, because they'll be looking out for information about maybe, maybe road, where roads are out and bridges are out. Not, so even though they'll, they'll, they'll do their own field surveys, they will be looking at, um, they'll be looking at perhaps um, other, other information of areas maybe they can't get to that quickly or where the emergency is more acute and they, you know, you just can't, maybe you can't fly in there or drive there. So there's, there's a lot of other sources that are available, you know, especially with mobile communications um, globally that people can report on and somehow trying to get that down into a usable form to say, okay, you, know, you could have a lot of people shouting in one area, but actually the need is not as great as in another area where, where perhaps they're quieter because they have been more great, they've been gr you know, greatly affected. So how do, you, how do you weigh up those sort of things? So it's, um, again, there has to be assessments done, but that's usually a little bit of a slower time. Sometimes it is, you know, it's the first few days you've really got to, particularly with emergencies that have a sudden impact, earthquakes, for example, where, you know, buildings topple and you've got to really, the, the first people who go in are going to be those who are making assessments as to, um, as to which buildings they need to uh, take in sort of a heavy um, uh, response, earthquake response to lighter earthquake response, I guess. So, yeah, it can be, it's, um, it, there, there, there is more information coming in and, and that's, again, comes down to the skill of, of, the, of, the, of the volunteer, I suppose. So you said hashtags, drones, satellites, social, social media, other ways that information is incorporated into GIS data? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, the, the other big thing, I mean, the other thing that happened um, over the past few years, which is probably now a bit uh, a bit older, but it was was people also being able to collect their own data. So there's plenty of, of tools that uh, people can be provided with um, if they know about them to co to collect what's going on around in their locale and be able to transmit that directly into uh, systems if the if the infrastructure's available. So if there's if there's mobile network that has decent data bandwidth, then maybe people could upload. You know, they could up start mapping their own areas to say look this is more damaged than others and it can for example i think in although again it's about 10 years ago but i think in haiti the, the people um, um they're giving gps units to guys on motorcycles to drive around the city to to do a lot of the data collection for them whereas traditionally that probably would have been done by more professional people using mm. quite expensive equipment but you know everything that you can pretty much do reasonably well uh, and, and the reasonable level of accuracy on a smartphone that you do, that you can now do, the regular person can do that, and uh, that can um, speed up the pace at which information can come in. So, what are the, what would those motorcyclists be collecting? Photographs and videos and roads? well, because it was ten, because it was ten years ago, I, it was it was mostly GPS points. So, so, so they, if they had a camera on them, sure, they could, they could do that. But they were, I think, I think there was, there was some fear that they wouldn't bring GPS units back, but um, I, I don't think that ever transpired. But, um, uh, but in this case, it was because there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of temporary encampments being built up. People would find an open space of ground where there wasn't any danger of, of buildings toppling on them or, or anything like that. And so they'll set up temporary camps, but these would move every day. So, you know, you pretty much have to be going out and, and surveying that in a sense as to where everything's moving, how many people were there. And that's and when, and if you're just trying to rely on the teams that you've got, there, you might not have enough people to do that effectively very quickly. So if you can use um, local people to, do, to collect on your behalf. So we... we as part of Map Action, what we we also obviously do those responses, but we also do run training as well. So we will work with um, other participants, such as a, uh, the Red Cross, the UN, and all its various organisations. So they understand um, how we operate, the sort of data we need, and we understand how they operate and the data they need. So we can sort of uh, collectively make sure we we have the right information. So when we're in the field under those very stressful conditions, that we can actually collect. Um, we can collect the appropriate level of, of information and make that usable for, for each of us. Um, but also we will work with um, local groups to, again, empower them to be able to capture data 
themselves. So um, with, with OpenStreetMap existing, um, people can start to uh, capture uh, data of the local area. And OpenStreetMap itself, uh, uh, or has various sort of um, spin-offs, branches, I don't know what the best term would be. So there's the humanitarian OpenStreetMap um, uh, uh, Open Street team, HOT, there's, um, there's another organization as well. They're, they're all about uh, making use, of allowing people, empowering people to collect data very quickly and being able to use that in the field. So if the, again, if an emergency happens, there will be teams remotely in uh, generally, uh, probably the UK and Europe and, and the US, which will start using whatever available satellite imagery there is to start capturing um, detailed building um, um, outlines because and streets because that can be immensely useful for any teams going in and being usable even if that's been partly destroyed it's still sometimes there is no other data to be you can't get hold of it so sometimes it may be that the country has very restrictive use of their geographical data and you and you can't get hold of it for whatever reason or they're, they're very cautious about who who actually uses it so being able to be able to very rapidly capture open source data and being able to make that usable by um by people on the ground rather than having to go to a ministry perhaps i mean uh, again things change and, and and this isn't always the case but sometimes it can speed it up maybe sometimes that you it's quicker to get data by having some volunteers collect it remotely or not mm. so, so there are a lot of more tools these days for the for the um for the individual or more sort of uh, amateur uh, volunteer to be able to help so with your current role, what you're doing with Bayonet, uh, with the data that you're, you're commercialising, um, is there anything that you can share with us now about some of the interesting tools or data sets that you're, you're releasing? Well, so, so, so like I said, Bayonet sort of has uh, operated, uh, operated in, um, is operating more in the commercial sphere and is operating in the military sphere. So on the military side, of course, we, 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 it's sort of the company's very much segregated. So, so that, that, that data we, we can't really disclose or do anything about. On the commercial side, what's interesting is uh, I think the UAE as a whole has invested quite a lot of time and money into into artificial intelligence, like I said. So where we came in is what, what can we do now that we can, we can maybe, we've got some, um, we've got some, um, not hardware, some, some vehicles and uh, collection devices that not many other people have. So whether those are mobile mapping units or whether those are aircraft, we can use that to, to capture and refresh data that, were, that traditionally would already have been done. But now what more can we do with that? So for example, um, we've been looking at how can we distinguish uh, different tree types? And if, mm. uh, and, and for, in a, in a, I think in a, as I understand it, in a, in a, in a national security sense, uh, the number of date palms is, is relatively significant. As in a, as I think as an emergency food source, it's like, uh, I think mm. that because there are so many of them. So how, how, can, how can you more effectively count those than, than having uh, somebody on the ground and, and you being able to recognize the, the shape and the pattern of date palms? So that's, uh, so that's, that's one project. Um, we worked on. We'll, uh, we did quite a few things with trees, actually. I think there was, there was quite a push towards being able to identify what vegetation is in the country. But also we we're, were looking at um, look how we could determine where um, aquifers are more likely to be from um, different geological formations. Um, we, uh, we only partly got so far uh, up to, this, to date. So we're really just trying to find out more things we can do with AI because again, the country's investing heavily in that. And um, it'll be a shame to sort of be behind the curb and maybe we can offer our expertise mm. in that place. Ian, I do want to thank you for your time. Before we finish, uh, if you have some career advice or some insights of experiences that you recommend our graduates who are just starting their career in emergency response, risk management, disaster preparedness, what sort of advice and guidance would you suggest that they get? Um, so for me, because I probably, because I, I would say that to, you don't have to, that you don't have to immerse yourself in a lot of technology to be able to understand what geography can do. I think probably from a few things I've said in, in this recording, I've, I've sort of seen that there's a lot of traditional elements that are still used today. And even just the very simplest of, of maps 
can be more useful than um, than a list than a, a set of um, tables or, or columns of of information because I I don't know maybe it's me but I think a lot of people are very visually oriented and mm -hmm. so if you can start to if you can picture a layout of where everything is and where things are happening it can it can sort of augment immensely what you may have just looked at as a, as a table of perhaps town names with population numbers and you can sort of get a better idea of so i'd say um that you don't have to go to it into great detail but certainly pick up some of the some of the gis elements if you can and there's certainly plenty of of introductory courses and, and training knocking around um for me the reason why i got into this in the first place was um, firstly, when I was at university doing, doing geography, um, I left that and my, my friends and colleagues were all going into um, accounting for some reason. It was very popular as a, as a, as a, a, a career to do after geography. And this, I, I always liked maps. So that for me personally, it was having maps. And then finding that you can actually use those to um, an organization like Map Action to be able to help people um, was, was also a great revelation as well, which was um, not... I always thought you had to join someone like um, Medicine Sans Frontier or, or maybe some of the, or the engineering core or something like that to really have, have an impact. So sometimes it could be the, the passion or skill that you've got doesn't necessarily have to be in one of the more hardcore technical humanitarian fields. Um, where I tend to probably fall down more on um, is around the policy side, um, which obviously drives a lot, of, a lot of response and that's you know, immensely important. But as but um, either way, there's there's many opportunities. I've I've had a, I've had the opportunity to work with um, with the World Bank um, on a number of their assessments and with other sort of international organisations. I I would never have had the opportunity before. So emergency management is a fantastic field to go into personally. I would say. Ian, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you doing this interview for us, and I'm sure our students are going to benefit from it. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Craig.